This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey guys, it's Vito Churko from Top Cat Sales in downtown Royal Oak. Are you looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or your corporation? Well, if so, then look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 miles. Through founder and former University of Michigan quarterback John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the very highest quality and the very best service. So get your organization, your school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going online to TopCatTeamSales.com. And once again, the website is TopCatTeamSales.com. And remember, you must follow Top Cat Sales on Twitter at Team Top Cat. And a welcome, welcome, welcome into the freshest, the latest edition of Tiger Stock with Chirko and Company. I'm your host, Vito Jerome Chirko. It is episode 65. Is it a milestone? I always kind of, I always like refer to these episodes, every five episodes as milestone or monumental episodes. So not really, but it's coming off of a monumental World Series, a World Series Game 7 that was a ratings bonanza for Major League Baseball, Doc. Where were you? Game seven. How did you experience it? Because I'll tell you, I was. Um, it was what day was it? Was it uh, Tuesday? Last Wednesday night. Last Wednesday into night. early Thursday morning, obviously too. So I was editing the podcast a little bit and watching. My wife fell asleep before Rajay Davis hit the home run, and I tweeted you and texted you. I was like, you know what? Wouldn't it be epic if Rajay Davis was going to end the World Series? I had thought that. You know what? To really make the Tigers fans suffer, Rajay Davis should hit the game-winning grand slam to, for Cleveland to win the entire thing. But Rajai Davis, you believe that, tied the game 6-6, and everyone's talking about the rain delay that maybe allowed the Chicago Cubs to end their drought. They had a team meeting. They regrouped. Had there not been a rain delay veto, I'm almost certain that the momentum that they got from Rajai Davis' home run, it was so epic that they probably would have, they would have came back, completed the comeback, and won the entire thing. I thought it was a great game. Now, yes, it, there were so many decisions that you can look back on by both managers and go, what the heck were they doing? But it was a game back and forth. Chicago was on top of their game early. They got to, out to an early lead. They took advantage of Kluber's. Um, he wasn't as sharp as we all had expected him to be, obviously with uh, his third performance, I believe, in nine days. he didn't, And it was his first time ever that he went uh, in an appearance and didn't strike anybody out. So... The game in and of itself is not probably the top three games of all time played, but the drama, the way it shook out, it was riveting. It was exciting. It was something that drew me in from pitch one until the very end. I have the last 15 minutes on DVR, and it's very exciting to see how that game ended. It was awesome, awesome for baseball, because if you were not a fan of baseball watching that game afterwards you got to be a fan. you got to be more invested. It was awesome. I kind of wanted to be like, Vito, give me a job on the beat, man. Hook me up. I wanted to be be all invested after watching that game. It was awesome. Awesome. And the rain delay only enhanced, I think, the awesomeness of it. Even though rain delays can drag on, it didn't. It lasted 15 to 17 minutes in length. Not too bad. Not too extensive. So that was good because nobody wanted a long, a super long rain delay that could have just dragged down the World Series drastically. And you would have lost viewers then, and maybe some people jumped off before them, but I don't think many did, and that's why Major League Baseball had a ratings bonanza on its hands. And what a sickening thought that ran through my head when I saw Rajai Davis hit that game-tying home run in the bottom of the eighth inning to make it a 6-6 to ball game. Sickening because of the fact that Rajai Davis barely had, what, five hits, less than five hits going into that at-bat in the entirety of the postseason? Not many hits at all, to sum it all up. And he wasn't great in the second half for the Tribe, really tailed off big time, and came out of nowhere to have a great first half, realistically, for the Tribe. The Tigers and every other Major League Baseball club did not expect to happen for Rajai Davis. So him just doing what he did in the first half of the season was something almost extraordinary at his age. And then stealing all the bases that he did. He stole like 12 bases last year, and he stole 30-plus a big amount of stolen bases this year. And 
out of nowhere for a guy that's nearing the end of his Major League Baseball career, and then he's the guy that ties up the game in Game 7 of the Fall Classic, and if the Indians would have won, if Rajai Davis also who hit that, remember, line drive up the middle in the later innings and after that game-tying home run shot. So seeing what he did... It was just tremendously painful to sum it up as a Tigers fan because he didn't do really anything close to that in the clutch with the Tigers at all. So how egregious was Joe Madden's decision to pull Hendricks? I mean, it was, I believe, the fifth inning, one walk. He was dealing, wasn't he? He was performing at a level that you wouldn't think that he would be pulled at that point in time, especially for Lester, because that made the game probably, if he doesn't pull Hendricks at that time, I think the game gets out of hand. Lester came in and was... You know, it was really odd because beforehand, Joe Madden had said he, he didn't want to bring him into a quote-unquote dirty game with runners on base with a, in a situation that he's not used to. And it, it was a situation where, you know, one wild pitch resulted in two runs and made it a 5-3 game. It was a situation where I go to myself, wow, Joe Madden might be doing some things that even though he's considered a great manager, he's doing some things that if they lose this game, might get the seat so hot that he might not return. In 2017, I bet you he would no, have been he fired. Been, no, he would not have been fired. Too great of a manager. One of the best oh. in the game. He got outmanaged, though, by Terry Francona. The reason why the Indians got to Game 7 almost was based on the managing, the classiness and the strategy involved in the managing of Terry Francona. How good, how superb he was in his in-game decisions, Terry Francona, and getting to his pitchers at the right times, the most opportune times, the whole entire time in the postseason, in the World Series, always clicked on the right decisions. So, or in so many words, just making the right decisions. As all those pitchers came in and got their jobs done, it seemed like continuously, it never was ending for Francona in his decision-making when he went from pitcher to pitcher in his bullpen. All those guys came in and seemingly had no trouble getting guys out in those roles that were not always accustomed to them as a result of the regular season, how they were used out of the tribe bullpen. And then in the postseason, two completely different animals and ways that you attack those two separate, you know, portions uh, of the season or two separate seasons, really, as the regular season is a completely different story. And uh, you have to attack it in a completely different way. And guess what? Francona did, and did it superbly in so many words. And once again, in my point that I'm trying to make here, he got the Indians to a Game 7 realistically based on all his great in-game decisions. And it was great to see the city of Cleveland get there, because you know what? Francona is full of class, and they deserve, after the season they had, overcoming all their odds, all the injuries. Michael Brantley, remember, played in only 11 games. And the injuries for their starting arms, Carrasco. Danny Salazar was only used out of the pen then in the postseason because he couldn't start anymore after getting hurt at the end of the regular season. And getting to the point to a Game 7 in the Fall Classic after all of that happened to the Indians, that was superb. And once again, because of that, a superb job done by Terry Francona and the Indians as a whole and a guy like Rajai Davis who once again came out of nowhere and that's why what he did in game seven not that he was doing anything else in the postseason leading up to that but because of what he did in game seven that hurt me because I know that he wasn't doing anything really before then in the playoffs or in the second half of the season at all doc now Chicago wins the World Series five million people attend the parade on Friday you kidding me Guess who went? My little cousin, who doesn't really like sports all that much. I don't know if the city of Chicago uh, closed down the entire school system for the day, but she went. And uh, maybe one day, you know, later on in a couple weeks or so, we'll dial her up and see what it was like to be there. But, Vito, it was the seventh largest gathering of all time. Five million people attended that parade, and it just looked like a fun day. The weather looked beautiful. Um, I seen that uh, WWE a fine uh, entertainment product sent to Chicago. Well, you think it's a fine entertainment product, and that's all it is. It's not a real sport. I didn't say it was, but it's very entertaining. They created created a Chicago Cubs uh, World Championship belt that was worn at the parade. All in all, the city of Chicago deserves it, and it was a great World Series. Now we can turn our attention to the Detroit Tigers because I don't believe we have chatted or discussed the first move that was made. Uh, Cameron Maben's move happened after we recorded the last podcast, right? 
It did. Cameron and Maben traded. Maben is gone, went to the Halos there after the Tigers picked up his contract option for $9 million, and they realized it was too, I guess, hefty of a contract option, and they want to lessen the payroll. And I think they realized, too, Doc, that he had a great year with the Tigers, but a career year that was, you know, unbeknownst to them, you know, because it wasn't expected. And it was a year that's almost unrepeatable. So... The people of this country are furious. The Tigers are selling, Vito. People are pissed. But when it happened, I understand the response. And we're going to talk all about that shortly, about uh, the Tigers starting to dismantle. But on this podcast, you have a lot of great insights and a lot of great information to present on this episode. Um, Some free agents that you think we should target. The reactions of um, the fans regarding Cameron Maben. And we have a lot to cover. What else? Did I miss anything? Uh, no. I mean, we have the free agent list, top 50 list that was done by MLB Trade Rumors that we have to look at. So that is going along with what you said already. And then looking at Verlander, Cabrera maybe being dealt. and Verlander he, made the list for Cy Young. He made the list as a finalist for the Cy Young Award. And you know what? Kyle Hendricks did for the Cubs. John Lester, two out of three of the best team in baseball. That was the best team in baseball. They deserved to win. I wanted to say that as well about the Cubs and them winning. It took 108 years. Some people never even saw a world championship won by the Cubs, and so it was good for them. The city deserved it, and man, did they celebrate, like you said, with that parade. And then seeing that Chris Bryant fielded the last out of Game 7 to win it all for the Cubs and threw it over to Anthony Rizzo at first base to record that final out of the series. How fitting was that, that those two guys made it happen for the Cubs, and they did with the bats, and especially Anthony Rizzo in the World Series. Hit 360 with a home run and five runs batted in during the Fall Classic. And Bryant wasn't too shabby himself. Two home runs, and then an 887 OPS. Those are their best two players offensively, and two young stars. And Bryant Because he's so young, you could still label him as a young phenom. And that guy will be a cornerstone for the Cubs at third base for a long, long time too, Doc. Real quickly, in future episodes of this podcast, I definitely want to dig into what and where in the hell did Theo Epstein come from? This young cat, dude, is an individual that um, came up very young with the Boston Red Sox. He's a young baseball genius of a mind. And now he goes to the Chicago Cubs and he turns them into a World Series champion? We got to look into that guy's story and profile what the hell has made that guy, you know, baseball royalty. He can he, he basically has a spot, a wing reserved for himself in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's so young. And I like the fact that he's personable and he's real. You know what he said? He said, "Listen, you know, I'm going to put a lot on the Cubs general manager for the next month because I'm going on a bender." And it was funny to see it was funny to see him drinking and having a good time. Bill Murray in the stands. Interviewing the the players for Fox on FS1 after the game. That was something to see, huh? That was awesome. And they were drinking and loving life. And Theo Epstein, as you said, he was gone, wasn't he? He was gone big time. But hey, more power to him to celebrate. He won with the Red Sox twice, broke their curse and broke the Cubbies curse. He's already a Hall of Famer at his young age. It's unbelievable what this guy's done. And he and everyone in town here in Detroit, they weren't even asking for him to come to Detroit. They bypassed the ball club here. They were asking him to come run the Lions. And well, so, now they are, right? Because he's broken all these other long droughts. Why not come with to the Detroit? Lions now? I was like, I tweeted out kind of, you know, a little bit hastily and maybe a little angrily like, hey, why are we worried so much about the Lions? Let him come to Detroit. Blow out Alavila. Let him come and run, <laughs> run the Tigers organization. Theo Caesars Arena. Do anything. Too bad it's not happening, right? Because they might build a statue outside of Wrigley Field. He's a made man. If they let if they let him go, I would be shocked. I think after 108 years, the feelings that he's he's garnered at least another 10 years of of service that he can put for the Cubs. He's a made guy, and 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 look at what's going to happen. The Cubs, the guys that won it, are not even 25, 26, 25 and under. They're my age and younger. Even they are a team that can be a dynasty. The first legit. Major League Baseball dynasty in a very long time, really since the days of the Yankees with Derek Jeter and their core four. Remember, they had Jeter, Mariano Rivera, Andy Pettit, and Jorge Posada. The Cubs have that and even more because they have, they have a nice mix of veterans, too. See, and then juxtapose that with what the Tigers announced. It's, oh, it's, it's in essence that you wanted that new PS3. You wanted that new iPhone. You go, you swipe that nice credit card, Vito, and when it come back, uh, sir, Vito... Your card's declined, bro. Yeah. You're yeah. Declined. It's like defaulting on a loan, You're like, right? What? Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you mean it's declined? I thought it was all good. In- all nice and shiny. Insufficient funds. Mm. And so it hit the fans of Detroit hard. People that weren't really in the know, 
kind of took it really, really hard when the news came that Cameron Mabin was going to be traded to the Angels. What you got back was not even really what's considered a prospect, a young guy, but, you know, 24, 25 years old and throws in the mid-90s, but his stats last year weren't that great. And you go, oh, they basically got rid of Cameron Maven's salary to save some money. And so the fans of Detroit took it really, really hard. And I understand their reaction because that's the first sign for them. The realization hit. The window may be shut on this past era. The Tigers are looking at a different direction. That it's likely that World Series as a goal, the World Series ring championship, hoisting the trophy for the next couple years is probably not within reason. So a lot of people were upset, and they saw that Cameron Mabin, when he was in the lineup, was a guy that was productive, a uh, glue guy. And so I believe that he deserved a spot on the team, but not at the price that he was going to be guaranteed. I agree fully that if that's the direction that you're going to go to cut payroll, I understand it. You know, El Vila only has so much money to spend. And unfortunately, if the word is you got to cut payroll, he's got to really hunker down. He's got the toughest job probably in Detroit right now because he's got to keep this team winning. At the same time, trending in a different direction, going more toward the more affordable, cheaper, but good player. Off-season reconstruction is tough, and it's tough for Al Avila. I'm feeling all right. I'm still feeling all right with that move after dealing Maven. I'm saying dealing Maven was fine. I told you, I said it. I didn't say it here first. I got to give credit to Tony Paul. He brought it up on his Twitter timeline. I tweeted it out last week after the deal was announced that it could happen. Paul said it, and then that is Tony Paul. And then I did reiterate it on my podcast last week, Doc. So I feel like I deserve some credit for kind of calling that to occur. And it did, and it was wise. Don't overreact. Relax, as Aaron Rodgers superbly said at one point when the Packers were struggling two years ago or something. He said, R E L A X. What does that spell? Gentlemen and women out there, uh, relax, Tigers fans. It's not a bad thing that they dealt Cameron Maven. He had a career year, I think, a career renaissance of sorts. And can you really trust him to replicate his production at the plate next year? He had a great OBP average, hitting as high as he did. He can't do that year to year. And I know he's on the younger side. Still, though, I think it's all right dealing him. It's about who they deal Next, and you know what? With the Tigers doing all this, it makes us all somber. At least me, I can say that much. It is that's why it's even it's so much better too now that the Indians lost because if the Indians would have won and beating the best team in baseball with the injury ridden roster that they have would have won, that would have just killed me, my hopes, my spirits because they're already downtrodden right now because of the Tigers' plans for the off season. I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception. There has never been anything like it. And we're going to have a special prosecutor. When I speak, I go out and speak. The people of this country are furious. Vito, come on, man. You're like, are you on the take? Listen, are you writing for the Tigers or something? You trying to get in there real quick or something? I'm not trying to be all warm and fuzzy right now. I'm just saying they made the right deal dealing Cameron Mabin. Listen, let's just Not say that they this. got the best in return. I don't think they right. got anything quality in return. Let me ask you this. If the funds were available, if the Tigers were not backing away from the situation where they don't have enough maybe funds or they're trying to cut back on their salary, not going with a $200 million payroll, wouldn't you want Cameron Maben on this team? Isn't he probably the best option at center field? Oh, better by than, far. Better than Jacoby Jones, better than any young prospect that they could throw into center field? By far, but I'm not backing off the sentiment that I just expressed that I think it's all right that they dealt him. I don't think people should overreact because I don't think, once again, that it can be repeated his production in 2016. I don't think it can be replicated in 2017. That's what I'm saying it's all right to deal him. I would say that it is debatable whether maybe you could cut salary by maybe trading J.D., uh, letting go of Victor Martinez, figuring out moves to cut that salary. Maybe Ian Kinsler will bring you a bigger haul. I would say that, potentially speaking, that if you wanted to add on salary, the two guys that you would keep are K-Rod and Cameron Mabin. Keep those two guys and look to cut elsewhere. And you you and I have talked about it. Ian Kinsler might be a better uh, situation where you move him along, get something more in return. I would say maybe Cameron, uh, you know, the the part that I guess the fans are looking at is, and we heard the reasoning, do you think that Cameron Mabin will decline in the coming seasons, that this was a, an outlier of well, a season? Yeah, I've, I've said that. that? I, think, I think it's an aberration. His production in 2016, I think, was a, an aberration of sorts. I don't know if it was a big-time aberration, but it definitely was. 
And that's how the Tigers decided to deal him because it's not worth paying him nine mil a year, which now I know in the current state of economics and baseball might not be the worst deal in the world to have Maben on that contract. So, I mean, the Tigers are taking the risk, though, of not having a great and or even a quality center fielder in 2017 because your options right now are Anthony Ghost and then Jacoby Jones on the roster as it stands right now. I don't think they will stand pat anywhere close to having those two options as possible starting center fielders. I don't think those guys will even crack the the starting lineup in in center field in 81-plus games. Now, that's half the season of a Major League Baseball season that is 162 games. Now, 161 the last two years for the Tigers, which is something in itself. But anyway, that's a topic for another day. As the point is here, I don't believe that Anthony Ghost or Jacoby Jones will be the everyday starting center fielder for the Tigers come opening day of 2017. I say no way, Jose. And Ghost is an extremely long shot of a guy. I don't think he's even in consideration right now for that starting center fielder job in 2017. And I think they should just cut ties with him completely after his disastrous 2016 campaign. All right, Vito, I was scouring the internet like I always do, multitasking. You do while you're not listening to me. A wrong. Trying to listen. You're absolutely wrong. Stop trying to... Uh, mi- stop trying Insinuate to- some stuff about you that's listen, not true, right? Listen, I know all you media people try and get all biased against us, but I'm hosting, running the board, taking phone calls, looking at the TV here for the election, and... Checking out Major League Baseball PR, and uh, guess who showed up on uh, MLB's network? J- uh, Tigers general manager Al Avila. And here's the quote of the day, and I think my head's going to explode because it's, mm-hmm. um, unfortunately, it's the sign of the times, and he's prefacing what we're all fearful of. And I quote from Major League, um, from MLB Network PR's Twitter account, quote unquote from Al Avila, our process and what we're trying to do may take three winters in order to get to where we want to get to. It's only begun. Oh boy, Vito. The ugly, the evil process. Three winters. Are you able to wait? The start long? of the downward spiral that is the Tigers franchise in the next three winters? Wow. This is bad. This is bad, utterly bad. I said before they should not have decided to retool this offseason to the degree that it sounds like they are looking now to retool. And the process this offseason has only begun because I'll talk about the guys that I think will be dealt for sure this offseason. But first, the Tigers are currently in the general manager meetings in Scottsdale, Arizona, which are held from November 7th, which was Monday of this week, until November 10th. And Alavila made those comments there at the GM meetings in Scottsdale, Arizona, as Doc already noted. And Anthony Fennick is covering it live for the free press. And he wrote an article And it details, in his opinion, the four big Detroit Tigers questions from the MLB GM meetings. And the first question is one that we've already covered, not extensively in this podcast, but a little bit so far, in that he does pose a question of, what will the Tigers do in center field? Do we really think, I've already expressed, I don't think either Jacoby Jones, too young, not good enough to play out there in center, and goes, I think the chance of him starting has passed him by big time. So I don't think either of those guys start. So the question is now for you, Doc, actually. you got to give me your opinion now here on episode 65 of Tigers Talk. Who starts in center field? One of those guys or somebody else? Come opening day of next year. Uh, isn't the consensus that Jacoby Jones is going to be the guy? I don't, I don't, I think even though maybe it is that from the fans, from bloggers out there, from people that speak from their behind, not like you, but other people that are fans that don't know maybe enough. I think they're saying it. I don't think truly he is a solution in center field for next year. Hold and maybe on. I'll be proven wrong. Hold I might on. be. Hold on. I know you like to call me your co-host. And I have you... called you my co-host, correct, in front of numerous people now, right? Yeah. But you haven't totally <laughs> admired from now, me. Okay, so now I'm your co-host. I'm a guy that doesn't listen. Well, now, you, don't listen. Well, you don't listen at times. Then, That's just me speaking the truth here. Then you slap me with another insult. No, that wasn't about you. That passively. wasn't about you. Oh, no, no. You linked at me looking like it was I did. Well, who am I going to look at? Your, the picture of you and your, your wife and your kids while I'm talking? No, you insinuated by how you're talking that I'm just like a fan. Now, I'm not you an are, expert. Are you a fan? I'm a fan. You've told me that before, though. I'm a fan. Yeah. But now what I'm saying to you and and addressing it to you before we talk about, you know, who the the Tigers should have at center field, I need to find a term to define me that's not... Totally a fan, right? Not a fan. Yeah. I'm not a fan. I think I'm a little bit now doing this for three years and where the network is at and what I do. I think I'm above a fan, but I'm not yet at the the level where I want to call myself a like a true host. So I'm, I'm... I think my talents indicate that I'm like a producer, 
producer extraordinaire. You really are the, the greatest producer that I've ever had. Seriously. Oh, really? Okay. Well, Michael Jason, I can't deny that he was good too, so I don't want to slight him, but I think the continuity that we've had, you deserve that status. Okay, so we can start. Yep. Don't address me by calling me a fan. Call me. Well, a- I'm sorry. You've called yourself a fan <laughs> in the past. Now you're calling me out for calling you what you've told me to call you or what you've said that you are in the past? Come on now. Now you're lying. I was full of lies. Now you're full of lies here. <laughs> but not to just take these low blows at each other the whole entire podcast. That would be fun, though, wouldn't it? Why not? I'll just keep going. Ready? What do you got next for me? I'll, oh. t- I'll give you one after. No, so now when, <laughs> when, when we're in public, yeah. if this is my producer. That's fine. I can say that easily. Do you? I got you. Okay. No, you deserve that. Seriously, you deserve that status big time. Okay, I feel better now. Thank you. Yeah, now you feel um, you feel validated, don't you? See, what I did there was just give me enough time to stall, get you all riled up so I can look up who, what, what, the, what the real deal <laughs> now is. You actually, <laughs> yeah, now, now he's all set. Now, now he can actually talk as a wise baseball. Now, producer exactly. of this podcast, Tiger Stock. So, Doc, what have you found? I found that on your fine publication, Freep.com, yep. that... Uh, Tigers prospect Jacoby Jones to focus on center field well, yeah, I in get the it. fall league. I get it, and he's done pretty decently. So okay, okay, he'll be he played exclusively in the Arizona Fall League as a center fielder. So do they want to win in twenty seventeen? What's it that it comes down to that? Are they really just getting rid of you know as many players as they can to cheapen their payroll and not caring about winning at all in twenty seventeen? If so, I think you put him out there, and maybe he'll surprise me. I hope he does, Doc. I'm a Tigers fan at heart. You know that much. So if he does well out there, and I think he's better than Anthony Ghost. If they're going to decide between one of those two guys to start every day in 2017 in center field, it won't be Ghost whatsoever. I'm going to put the odds of him starting out there in 2017 at below 5%. So Jones deserves it over Ghost at least. Now correct me if I'm wrong, yes. but didn't I read that Lloyd McClendon has been upped yeah. from the minors to be the Tigers' Hitting coach now uh, in the 2017 season. He's the new hitting coach replacing Joyner, correct? Correct. And then Leon Bull Durham from AAA Toledo, this hitting guru in AAA with the Mud Hens, is now a guy that's up with the big league ball club as well as the assistant hitting coach to Lloyd McClendon. We, we should have noted that before, I guess, too. And we have to also note that Anthony Ghost and the McClendon had a falling out. And by all accounts, and the rumors are, they haven't spoken since Anthony Ghost and McClendon got into that beef. So that might be something where they have to mend and do some repairing, heavy, heavy duty repairing. If Anthony goes, I just don't see him. How many? Now, what are the odds? Big vetoes over under. Let me get you on the spot here now. Over under twenty five percent that he is the everyday under, starting center field. Under twenty percent. I think they're going to yeah. give it to uh, Jacoby Jones. Give it a start. See how that goes, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, you know what? Rajai Davis is a guy who was not extended a qualifying offer by the Indians, so they don't care about. For as much as he did, hey, doesn't even mean anything to the Indians. Now, he could be a candidate to play center field here. Do you really want to bring him back, though, to Motown? I don't want him to do that, to come back here. And I don't think Alavila is entertaining it. Now, a former Tiger that we have talked about, kind of ad nauseum now, that I think he's entertaining the idea of bringing back, is his own son, Alex Avila. I think that will happen, and that's one of the the roster voids that the club, that Alavila and the Tigers front office brass, will address this offseason. I think... Alex Avila, when healthy, is a definite upgrade over Jared Saltalamacchia, who had four clutch home runs or something, and maybe I'm dogging him a little bit and not acknowledging the fact that he hit a few more, had a few more clutch hits, but that's about all he did. Doc, when you look at Jared Saltalamacchia's stats, which, can you say his last name five times fast? Probably not, but nobody can. And the biggest asset, though, in so many words that he brought was his stick, and hitting home runs here and there in clutch situations. Outside of that, Doc, what did he do that you can name off right now? Not too much. Yeah. So uh, now another big veto is over under. A couple other names that might end up in that position. What is, let's say, 50% Tyler Collins? As a starting center fielder, I still say below. I'm going to say around 25% for you with that. And you know what? They're going to have to address that void out there, Doc. And maybe Jacoby Jones is the guy. I'll say this much for all those who believe that he's the consensus favorite, you know, to play center field starting with opening day of 2017. I'll say that he is the favorite. He is and has the best odds, then, with that being said, of starting in center field of him, Ghost, and Tyler Collins. I think Collins has a little to no shot as well of being a starting outfielder and then starting center fielder, too. Okay, and courtesy of BlessYouBoys.com, yep. the long shots are Andrew Romine, Winton Bernard. Oh, yeah, those guys have no shot. And Connor Harrell. I don't know who the third guy is, so I don't think he Never has... Never heard of uh, no. Tiger's seventh-round pick in 2013, spent all of last year at Double A Erie. I'm not going to lie. Don't know the name, but there are, and that's a jaw-dropper for Doc. It, you know, I probably... Well, should I? I don't know if I should. Anyways. Go ahead. Go for it. I was going to say, the next topic I wanted to address with you on this week's edition of the podcast is 
the topic of big names that could be dealt from the Tigers roster and guys that made a big impact on the 2016 team. And I wanted to do a little kind of yes or no here with you about whether or not these guys, following guys here, will be dealt. And now we're hearing from John Heyman of Fan Rag Sports. He pointed out that Justin Verlander and Miguel Cabrera could be guys that are dealt this offseason. Now, Verlander, we've already heard about. We've kind of known that he might be out there as a possibility to be dealt. I think he is actually, guys. But let me just ask you straight up now. Justin Verlander, starting with him, will he be a Tiger in 2017, Doc? Yes or no? Yes, he will be. Um, I believe that he probably, despite what you may think, may do you think he's an organizational guy where if they come to him and say, hey, listen, the Red Sox are preparing an offer that we just can't deny, and they make that move, does Verlander look the, the Tigers organization in the face and just say, no, I decline the trade? He still has that right to do that. And you're hearing rumors that Boston, the Dodgers, they're lining up uh, big time offers for Verlander, but he has he has the control. So as long as he has the control, I don't know why it's I mean, obviously, he he would want to go for the ring. And if they're saying that maybe Alavila is kind of sprinkling that out there, that it's going to take three years to kind of let these big guys know that, hey, the winning might be over. Maybe that's done, you know, subconsciously by Alavila or purposely to try and maybe facilitate and start the process of facilitating that move. It's all in, in JV's hands. He could do it, but if he uh, wants to win, I think it's starting to look like his best options are to leave. And he still hasn't won a World Series, and he deserves to win one. Now, not everybody wins a World Series or a championship in any professional sports league. Verlander, though, is a guy that definitely deserves it and has a big market now for him, big value because of the fact that he's coming off a season in which he was deemed a Cy Young finalist in the American League, as we noted previously in this week's edition of the pod already, Doc. And he could very easily win the Cy Young, but my favorite to win it, my pick, I guess you could say, is Corey Kluber. I picked him before. Kluber is my pick to win the Cy Young. Now, for you, I think you agreed with me before. Are you still on the Corey Kluber bandwagon? Of course. He was unbelievable. Really key contributor to the Indians. Solid performance in the World Series. I just think that... uh, what we started to see was the overuse of pitchers by two great managers. And uh, unfortunately, Corey Kluber wasn't able to deliver solid performance in Game 7, but can you really blame him? Dude was on shorter rest. Three appearances in nine days? Come on now. But he did a great job in the regular season, good enough to win the Cy Young. That is absolutely true, Doc. And remember, the Cy Young... You know, it's based on the regular season, too, and that's why those players that don't make the playoffs have a chance to win their respective awards. And Verlander does, has a merit to win the award. But the premise of this discussion is not about who's going to win the Cy Young Award, remember, too. It is about, actually, whether or not we think he can be dealt. And the reason why he's a candidate right now, a viable candidate, too, is because of the great season that he had. And the Tigers have to weigh the pros and cons of dealing him right now and the risk of not dealing him now, Doc. And then in two years from now, when they maybe want to deal him once again, him not having that same value, which means you're not going to get the same great coop of prospects or of young players to help your ball club build a contender for the future. So right now, they're definitely sidestepping on a winning, you know, fast forwarding to the future. Then you deal JV right now. And there are teams that definitely will entertain the idea of dealing for him, such as perhaps the L.A. Dodgers and maybe some other big market ball clubs. And that's the team in the Dodgers out there in L.A. that I think he would waive his no-trade clause to join because he likes the bright lights. His his future wife, Kate Upton, is a supermodel. She loves the bright lights. It's all about Hollywood. And I think both of them are about the Hollywood lifestyle. That would be a perfect fit. The thing is, they have the prospects to match up for a deal for Verlander, but are they willing to do it? They have what it takes, but these teams now, Doc, we have to also realize this and take all this into account. Will these teams be willing to deal their prospects? Because a lot of these teams that are big market clubs that have spent big money in the past on free agents or given up these big amount of prospects to get major league ready talent, these teams at this point, at the present juncture in the franchises, aren't necessarily as willing to deal their prospects anymore because they're trying to build from within as well, just like the small market ball clubs, like the Royals, like the Indians have done. The Dodgers, the Yankees have replicated those teams and have taken a page or two out of the blueprint that the Royals produced in their two straight years of winning the AL pennant. The Indians even produced in 2016 in winning the AL pennant. 
So these teams, in so many words, are less and less likely to deal for big-name players, and that's why Verlander, the Tigers, might just have to keep him, even though they might be willing to deal him. And I believe they are. The problem is I think they're more willing to deal him than teams are willing to deal for him. And that would be the problem with another big name on the Tigers roster right now in Miguel Cabrera, who's won a Triple Crown. He's won the MVP awards, and he deserves to be a Hall of Famer at the end of his career, and will be, and will, at the end of his days in the majors, be deemed as one of the greatest to ever lace up not only the cleats, but also lace up the cleats, well, for sure, in a Tigers uniform. So the Tigers risk losing a major part of their fan base by dealing Verlander because of that same reasoning, and also Cabrera for that reasoning. And they have to weigh that as well in any deal they entertain that includes Verlander or Cabrera. And I think Cabrera now, to get to the point here that I'm trying to make, which, well, it involves me asking you now about your opinion on it, whether or not he will be dealt. I think Miguel Cabrera, the chances of him being dealt and Verlander are both below 50%, but Verlander, there is more, I think, reason to do so. And that's why I think the Tigers will be more willing to deal him for the right offer. I think Cabrera, even though they're saying John Heyman just reported recently, as I said already, in an article on Tuesday, he said the Tigers are willing to listen to offers for Cabby. I don't think that's completely true. It would take a lot more to deal him, and I think he's deemed as more unmovable because of his hefty contract and because he didn't just have almost a career year as JV did. Miguel Cabrera's production is still there. It's very good. I think some people see him tailing off like Albert Pujols did once he joined the LA Angels of Anaheim. And because of that, I don't think there's many takers at all for Miguel Cabrera. Right now, I'm going to say no on Miggy, and I'll say no on JV, but I could realistically, Doc, at this point, see JV being dealt. They're going to try. They're fielding the offers. We all know it. We're all hearing this situation. We're all day by day watching what Alavil is doing. He's got a tough job. I mean, you have to get value for JV too. And how many prospects is it going to take for Alavil to be willing to part ways with JV? It's a delicate situation. And uh, I do give Alavil credit in that uh, he's standing up there taking the heat. He knows that the Tigers are in a, basically a retool, rebuild, whatever you want to call it. It's a delicate situation that they're in, but he has the job of going out there and scouring the landscape and finding out what finding out what his talent is worth and pulling a pulling off a trade that will not only allow this team to be competitive that's the tough part is do you think the fan base is going to be receptive now based upon the reaction that they had when they just lost Cameron Mabin it was just him i know do you think the fan base is going to be receptive next year do you see another drop in attendance in 2017 because in essence what they've said is we're a team that's on the decline, but we still have some pieces that are entertaining. I mean, I do see that if he just came out and said, listen, we're going to be a, a ball club that's going to rely super heavily on our pitchers, I like the starting rotation. If you can get a solid 4-5 or five starter from JV, maybe you trade Ian Kinsler for another reliable starter, you got three, four starters that can win you a lot of games. And maybe you don't go and go out and shoot to play 9-8 ball games. You go out there and try to win 3-2 to two more often than not and become a pitching ball club. You can do a lot of things a la the Indians with a lesser payroll and quality starting pitching. And I think that if, if that's going to be the target, if you're looking to get value, find arms that can produce. And the other aspect, Vito, and we've been clamoring for it, and it's, it's about time where we call it an epidemic, Al Avila's job and his number one A-plus prime target that he has to do is assemble a bullpen. Assemble a bullpen that you can reliably, consistently utilize in the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth inning, where it's not so much of a roller coaster. I think if they do that, they get a couple of starters, they can rebuild that bullpen where it's not so up and down. I think the fans are more than willing to be patient. But hell no, if early on next year, we go out there with a 2 nothing lead in the 8th, and you got Ron Doan giving up home runs and K Rod taking 50 pitches to get a three out save. Hell no, we are not tolerating that anymore. It's his job. It's prime target number one. Fix this bullpen. I don't care how long it takes. Fix it and put to, and don't tell me that guys like Kyle Ryan, don't tell me guys like Buck Farmer are your answer. I don't care if they're cheap. They're not worth the 500K that you're paying them. Move on. Disassemble whatever. You know, bullpen arms six through nine, you have. Let them go. You got K Rod, you got Rondone, you got 
Alex Wilson situationally, everybody else I could part ways with. I don't care. And you know what? The attendance has already gone down. And guess what? JV and Cabrera are easily picks to click, okay? They are easily the people, the players on the team that you pick to be the MVP of many of the games that they play in. Verlander, almost every single start, you can pick him to be the MVP, the player of the game on the Fox Sports Detroit broadcast. You know, the announcers get to do that. The fans do as well when they chime in. And you can easily pick him to be the player of the game. And Cabrera, same thing. Every single time he goes out there, you can expect him to do something. So if you lose those guys, attendance goes down even more in 2017. And it's because they have box office value. Without them, fans don't deem they're getting the best bang for their buck with the team that is void of Verlander or Miguel Cabrera. And that's just one of the two being gone. Imagine both of those players not being on the roster. They would have to extremely endure a lot of pain and suffering the front office, the attendance, and the drastic dip that it would take because a drastic dip in attendance would occur if you deal either Verlander or Cabrera. So that's a great discussion because there's so much you could really dive into when it comes to that topic of dealing those two guys. Because there is that factor that you have to weigh, which is the attendance. And then also the PR nightmare on the hands of the Tigers' ownership, on Chris Illich, Mr. I, on the Tigers' front office brass, of dealing, of just dealing even one of those two guys, of Verlander or Cabrera. But in so many words, I don't see the Tigers dealing. As I said before, don't see them dealing either. Verlander or Cabrera, but JV is more likely to get dealt. And now, bringing this discussion back to just some other big names on their roster that we could see being dealt this offseason. I said Maven was a possibility, and he's gone now. Now, I want to ask you about, and I'm going to give my answers here first, about J.D. Martinez and Ian Kinsler, Victor Martinez, covering those three players right now. I'm going to say that the Tigers do end up dealing J.D. Martinez and end up dealing Ian Kinsler. I think they're willing to take a hit in those positions to lessen the payroll. And because J.D. is due for a big payday very soon, and Kinsler had kind of a rough second half, they deem those guys to be movable, to get younger, and to lessen the payroll subsequently as well. How about you now, Doc, with those two guys? Do they move on from J.D. and from Ian Kinsler? Yes or no? I disagree with the notion that they should move J.D. I think that that's a guy that if you want to commit to long-term is a 25-home run guy, a leader-type guy, a guy that's created some positive memories for the organization, a guy that you plucked out of of obscurity from Houston. That's a guy that uh, I would really invest in heavily. You can get a lot for him, but if you're going to look to, of those two, I would get rid of Ian Kinsler and see what you can get for him. Ian Kinsler. But my Jay question Bush. now is, do you think they will? Now, yeah, yeah. will it happen where they get dealt? No matter what you think, because I don't think JD should be moved either. Right. I think just now, Ian. Will it happen? I think yes or no on those two guys. I think JD is probably the the smoke is getting a little bit uh, too thick. A lot of talk about it where there's smoke, there's fire. Yes. And I think the talks are happening, and I do believe that he probably won't be a Tiger. Because of the fact, not only is the rumors out there that he's declined big money offers, that you probably can't afford them anymore. And you had a chance last year to do it if you wanted to look longer term and really make him a, a significant offer. I think that he bet on himself, and he's probably in the neighborhood of $20 million a year. So I think that they're going to look to get something out of him. Ian Kinsler now, yes or no, on him being dealt? They're trying. That, that's a tough one because of his age. I think you're, he has value because, really, in the end, who's going to play second base for you that's going to be reliable and produce those numbers I would keep him and he's a gold glove finalist remember Ian Kinsler a guy that should have won it according to fielding bible last year so maybe he gets some redemption and wins it this year maybe that increases his value as he hit the the long ball this year and you know what he did a good job in the leadoff spot he did in all those leadoff home runs that he produced so he has some value right now I think the Tigers should deal him I think they will deal him and JD Martinez now to two other guys here as we try to end this discussion about guys, major guys on the roster that they might deal this offseason. And now I want to talk to you, first and foremost, of these last two guys that I wanted to bring up. The first one that I wanted to bring up is Justin Upton. Jay Up, who they presumably, and according to reports, actually tried to deal at the trade deadline and failed to do so because he was struggling miserably in the first half. Yes or no on him being dealt by the Tigers? Vito, do you see that light in the corner? It's going off like bling, 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 bling. You have went... 45 minutes on this segment. Do you not look at the clock? Do you not look at the glass? Well, we're still, just the on. We're still 45 minutes in. I gotta, I'm, giving, I'm giving you a topic <laughs> to discuss with me. I want, now, I want answers now. Okay. All right. Here's I want answers. So about 
So you're not, first. So you're not yes taking, or no? You're not taking the cue from your producer to take. Oh, a I break. didn't see a cue before this. <laughs> well, I know we have a commercial break. We have to take a. But I say let's just run right past that. Oh, sorry, right. it's okay. Yeah, you're, you're the boss. That's what I'm I like. I'm sorry. Go I, on though, Doc. <laughs> anyway, so to the so now you've extended it because you didn't answer my question. Jay Upton is a guy that uh, they've. You've heard rumors that they tried to trade him in the year. Um, it's a big contract. His value to the team significantly went up with his performance in the second half. I would say, obviously, they're going to try to move him, but I think he has value as the another outfielder that can produce. And if you're going to let go of JD, you're going to need some kind of uh, some kind of pop, some kind of protection for the guys. I think J, I think uh, Upton, you know, really is a solid player. And I think once he got comfortable, he was the hottest player in baseball. How do you trade him? How do you? Well, how do you deal like JD, as we said? But I know what you're saying. You've locked up Upton for a while. Yeah. He's a, you know the best case scenario is he goes off for another 35 home runs this year, and then he just goes, bada-boom, peace, and uh, gets a big-time deal where it's longer-term and more money than he makes. Because remember, he's got control after the 2017 season. He can opt out. He can, can decide. opt out or opt in, yeah. He can yep. opt out, and uh, if he wants security, he can opt in and stay. Or after the, the second year, he can decide, you know, I'm much more valuable, get on a winning ball club, and uh, go from there. You got to, re- you know, this comment from Al Avila, I'm really thinking – has a lot more undertones of like, hey, we're not going to win for a while. Let's start sprinkling that out there so the, the the guys on the team can realize, hey, this might be a rebuild too. So if a guy like Upton gets presented with a deal, whereas maybe he might be leaning towards staying, he might just go, ah, you know what? If it's going to take a couple more years, you know, I'm going to be 32, 33 before we start winning. Still young, relatively speaking, if you saw what Ian Kinsler did, but it might be another opportunity as a signal to let him know, hey, you know, we might uh, want to part ways soon. I don't think Bmart gets dealt or Justin Upton. And Upton, you made a good point because if they deal J.D. Martinez, which we both expect to happen right now, they need his bat in the middle of their order for some kind of run production. So I think Upton stays on the payroll for 2017 for the Tigers. And Victor Martinez, because he's so old, he's aging, didn't hit that great in the last month of the season. I think they got to keep him. And while they will end up, their hands are tied with them, and they will end up having Vmart as their D.H., come opening day next year. Doc, Victor Martinez for you. Yes or no on whether or not the Tigers will deal him this offseason. Victor? Victor Martinez, correct. Oh, man, that's a tough one. No, I just think that uh, it's too old. I mean, literally, the guy hits doubles but can't get there because of his age. I mean, he he broke down. He's got value as a DH. I mean, Boston could utilize, you know, they just recently lost their best DH. That's a team that, you know, you could say that, you know, could add him, but... Unfortunately, he breaks down and he's he's getting older. He's got worth he's worth it for a bat, but if you can look to get rid of him, I don't know who's going to take on that deal. And you know, I don't think anybody will take it on Doc. Honestly, now we're moving on, jumping forward to one last topic to sum up or end all of today's and this week's discussion on Tigers Talk, episode sixty five of the pod, and it's about the free agent list, the top fifty free agents as reported by or according to the opinions of MLB trade rumors and. They put at number one, and to no surprise, Ioannis Cespedes. And he opted out of his deal with the Mets to join the free agent market. And he is the class. He is uh, at the top of the class of this year's free agent class, to say the least, Doc. Now, you might have thought there was a chance if the Tigers would have been willing to spend some money this offseason that maybe, hey, maybe you get rid of Justin Upton, get rid of that semi, at least semi mistake in signing Upton, and get Yohannes Cespedes, the guy they should have signed, actually, instead of Jay Up, to play the corner outfield last year. And Cespedes even could be their center fielder at this point after getting rid of Cameron Mabin. But a guy like that, Yohannes Cespedes, with the big money tag that he brings with him right now, no way, Jose, is he going to be a Tiger in 2017. So we can put that discussion down. We can just end it right now, the discussion of Yohannes Cespedes possibly joining the Tigers for 2017 and beyond. Yeah, no, I don't see that happening. And then you look at some other big names, Edwin and Canarcion. He's a DH guy. You got Vmart there. Not going to happen for the Tigers. Aroldis Chapman, the best relief pitcher, a closer type. But they just picked up the contract option of K-Rod, and they don't want to spend the money this offseason. So realistically, Aroldis Chapman, there's no chance of him coming to Motown as well. And they could use bullpen arms, and we talked about that. Did you hear That's story? a big area of need. Did you hear what the Yankees are considering doing with Aroldis Chapman? That's GM greatness. You get a bunch of prospects for him, let him go, let him go earn his ring, and then bring him back. That's not bad at all. I was thinking, man, that's that's not bad to let go of some talent, get some guys in, add to your add to your roster there, and then bring him back. 
He's got his ring. He's more satisfied. Araldus Chapman could be the closer of the future. Great job by Cashman. I think if that if that uh, works itself out, that's that's good. That's a good deal. Well, yeah, you got some young players for the future, and that's what the Yankees are trying to do is build for the future. Then you get him back for the end, the back end of your bullpen. I mean, he's an elite closer. So any team upgrades when you get Aroldis Chapman. And I'm going to say I want to start with you want to suspect us and kind of predict where he's going to land really quick, Doc. With you, I think the Giants who are needing that one big bat, I think he goes to San Fran. Mm. I'm going to say that about you want to suspect us. Mm, interesting. Oh, thank you for saying. I well. It better be interesting, right? I lost all interest in Yoannis once he left the Tigers. Forget about him. Fortunately, that guy, you know, what was the story again? He was uh, not going to sign here. Well, they said he might then take a deal, and then the Tigers, I don't think, pursued him heavily enough to get him to come back to Motown. And refresh my memory. He got traded, right, in the um, Fulmer deal? He got deal? traded for Michael Fulmer, so the Tigers, hey, they made out like a bandit, right? That's exactly. an old saying, right, that my dad and mama said in the past. Yep, Yoannis Cespedes, out of sight, out of mind. But we did talk about him early in the year, I do remember, because he was mashing the hell well, out of and baseball. Then, and then he had, he had his hot stretches, and Jay Up didn't until the very end of the year. Right. But Upton, hey, did do something. we got to give him that much. Exactly. Anyways, moving on to Edwin and Canarcion. Now, you claim that maybe V-Mart would be a fit for the Red Sox because he's a DH, just like his fellow DH, Big Poppy, David Ortiz, who retired now, one of the greatest to ever play the, well, play in the majors and to play DH. And Edwin and Canarcion profiles great as the replacement for Big Poppy in being town. So I like Edwin and Canarcion going to the Red Sox, and so does MLB Trade Rumors. By the way, MLB Trade Rumors predicted Yohannes Cespedes to land with the Dodgers on a five year, $125 million deal. I think he'll get about that in total as well on the open market this offseason. Now, they've said Encarnacion to the Bo Sox for four years at 92 mil. He might touch 100 mil in totality. And Aroldis Chapman, it's sounding more and more likely he's going to the Bronx to pitch once again for the Yankees. So I kind of like that prediction as well. I am going to go along with that about Chapman myself. And then you look at some other names in the top 15 for MLB Trade Rumors list of free agents this offseason. And you see a name like Dexter Fowler who was a star center fielder for the Cubs, helped them out immensely this year. And where would they have been without him? And they almost lost him to the Baltimore Orioles. It will be hard for the Cubs to retain him, and I don't see him re-signing with the Cubs, Dexter Fowler, that is, this offseason. He's a guy that could fit, though, perfectly, guess where? With the Tigers in center field, Doc. Mm, Very interesting. Uh, What's his price salary uh, per season? What's he looking at? Well, it says four years, 64 mil. And, you know, the Tigers are not willing to... I think pays a pretty penny to get anybody. No, they're going young. And remember, do you take Alavila at his word? And he said, we're not looking to bring in big-time guys. So, no, I think Fowler will will, will, uh, garner interest uh, probably elsewhere. And it looks like Joey Bats, another top 15 free agent, according to MLB Trade Rumors, another bat that could be leaving Toronto to play for another ball club where, I mean, he could be a DH, still a corner outfielder, and... If he goes back to the Jays, well, they need him now perhaps more than ever because Edwin and Canarcion seems like he's for sure leaving Toronto for, I guess, greener pastures, right? Now, Bautista, MLB Trade Rumors is predicting, will go back to Toronto. It's about the fact whether or not they're willing to pay for him to go back to Toronto because he's, at this point, 36 years old. So he's no spring chicken at this point, and maybe they want to get younger there in Toronto. But if they still want to win, they got to resign one of those two. And I think Bautista is a more likely guy to get resigned than Edwin and Canarcion. Spot on, brother. Good stuff. And now, the other thing to note, really quick, is that the best starting arm is Rich Hill. Uh, That's how weak the open market is in free agency this offseason. That tells you right there. And you don't really, if you're a team looking for a starting pitcher, that's why... Justin Verlander, back to a Tigers note here, is more appealing to the masses than maybe he would be in a previous offseason because there's not those great starting arms to get on the open market, such as a David Price or Max Scherzer. It's Rich Hill, and then not a lot of anything else, and really he's not anything himself, and he's heading the free agent class of starting pitchers. Sad but true right now. That's the current market of pitchers this offseason, Doc. Gotcha, sir. Great podcast. I know you're blowing through all the breaks, so I'll help you out as a producer. We'll put the break in a timely spot for you, and I know how we'll take care of it. Next week, I definitely want to dive into, and I know you're going to research, the Tigers made front office moves in the last week. They added the uh, the Yankees numbers guy, and they've added to the front office. So you know, we've talked about it, they're looking in the direction of using analytics in a much more efficient way 
we'll dive into next week who this gentleman is that they brought on, the use of analytics, what does that mean in terms of the guys that you you uh, discussed, and maybe some under-the-radar free agents that may not be exactly top of the top of mind, but could come up maybe from the minors or could be um, out there in free agency that could help this team if we kind of manipulate the numbers and explore what different free agents could offer this ball club. So the Tigers are going cheaper. They need more value from the money that they're spending. I get it. They're, they're looking to a numbers guy from the Yankees. Not a bad not a bad uh, idea if this guy can do the job because if you're going to go Saber Metrics, you got to have experts and you got to you know handle the business properly. And look at what the Bronx Bombers have done. They've cut their spending immensely, barely spent anything last offseason and getting free agents really didn't spend anything at all and they're going younger so if you can build a roster that replicates the Yankees what they're doing right now as a model I think it's perfect it's a way of things going forward in baseball and the Tigers should do it should replicate it and I think they will and hey it's the right guy then I guess to bring on board and with that we have the winter meetings coming up in December to discuss immensely as well and that's when the hot still really picks up by the way doc as well maybe the Tigers Make a move or two to upgrade the bullpen, and I think that's what will happen for the Tigers. Stuff on the cheap like that. Yes, sir. Episode 65. Man, that was probably, we just turned on the microphones, blinked, 58 minutes flew by. Awesome. Oh, my goodness. Great job to you. Hopefully everybody enjoys what we just, you know, spit out there and everything. And we'll be back next week for episode 66 of Tigers Talk for some more off-season baseball news and notes. Dr. Producer signs off. Adios. (laughs) 